Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Sproles, and I'm the president of the New York School of Interior Design, and we are thrilled to have you here this evening for the annual Sally Henderson Memorial Lecture on Green Design, uh, which will pre be presented this evening by Michael Murphy. Uh, Sally Henderson was a beloved faculty member here at the New York School and developed the college's first course in green design. Upon her untimely death in 2002, an endowed fund was set up in her memory to support an annual lecture on sustainable design. Thanks in part to Sally's pioneering efforts, the New York School is dedicated to educating future designers who incorporate sustainable solutions in their practices. And with our graduate program in healthcare interior design, we also embrace the power of design to heal. And I am sure that Sally would be thrilled with uh, tonight's lecturer, Michael Murphy. Michael is the executive director of Mass Design Group, uh, an architectural and design firm based in Boston, which he co-founded with Alan Ricks in 2008. Mass's work seeks to leverage design to improve lives through a variety of mediums, uh, from architecture and construction to policy and research. In just a few short years, Mass has designed and built healthcare facilities and schools in Rwanda, Liberia, Burundi, and Haiti combining low-cost, locally available construction materials with innovative and appropriate design. Now, Michael is a graduate of the University of Chicago and Harvard University's Graduate School of Design. He is a regarded thought leader in architecture and healthcare design. In fact, the Atlantic Monthly listed him as one of the greatest innovators of today. He's chuckling right now. So. <laughs> uh, in the past year alone, Mass was named finalist for the TED Prize, the Aga Khan Award for Architecture, and Buckminster F uh, Fuller Challenge, and received the World Architecture News Bureau Hapold Award. He regularly speaks to a variety of audiences on architecture and healthcare, and sits on the boards of the Clinton Global Initiative Advisory Committee, uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Design Alumni Board, and the Center for Healthcare Design, among many others. So like I said, we are thrilled to have him here tonight, and I'm gonna pass the podium on over to you and invite you all to a reception immediately following the talk in our 69th Street Gallery. So Michael, it's all yours. Thank you so much, David. It's really uh, terrific to be here, and um, I'm really humbled to be part of this memorial lecture. So um, I'm glad you brought up some of the things that I love to talk about, uh, how buildings can heal, the direct relationship between buildings and health. And I thought I would sort of talk a little bit tonight on some new research, which is really looking at how that in particular uh, addresses the building of hospitals and healthcare spaces as they're changing. Uh, and in particular around um, uh, the changes in the Affordable Care Act and how that will um, shape the healthcare spaces that we might see in the future. So I'm calling this lecture, this new content, uh, The Future of the Hospital, and I, I welcome your conversation and, and, and questions about it. Um, I thought I would just start with uh, why we got interested in, in this, uh, in particular how I got interested in hospital spaces. Um, so this is a very, very famous hospital in New York City. You may know it. Uh, no, I won't name it, but it's up here in the Upper East Side. And uh, I, as an architect student in, in 2006, I found myself here because uh, I got a call from my mother and my father had gone, uh, who had been suffering from cancer, had gone into septic shock and had been brought to this hospital uh, in order to recover from Poughkeepsie, New York, which is where I'm from. And um, obviously quite terrified, I left my first studio um, review for my first final project at my, at, uh, my architecture review and drove to this hospital in New York. And um, fortunately, my father survived, uh, but he was in one of these isolated rooms uh, that you can see kind of in here. And it was the holiday season about this time. Actually, I think it was just about this time, or like December 9th or so. And so he was stuck in the hospital through, through the holiday season and we spent Christmas in the hospital. And, um, and I remember being in this isolated and lonely and empty facility um, and the few nurses that were left during the holiday season told him, uh, well, to get your uh, workout, to get your exercise, why don't you walk around this hallway? Uh, a few laps will do, about four, um, four laps at a time. Uh, 
what we might call this racetrack. Please avoid all of the monitoring equipment and um, other stuff that's in the hallway that obviously has been designed uh, not to hurt the walls, let alone the patients. Um, and I, I just remember how inhumane this experience was. Uh, that there was no light, there were no windows. Um, it was kind of this horrific exercise pathway without any visibility of why he was doing it or where he was um, supposed to recover. And I just remember thinking then in my early days as an architect, wouldn't it be amazing to be able to design hospitals so they could be humane again? Um, and I think more generally, this is quite true uh, in our healthcare spaces in general. And this is an architecture problem, it's an interior design problem, it's a design problem. Our hospitals are not humane environments. And the question of why they're not humane, why they don't think about the actual humans that are using them, or, or is not a very simple, it's not a, there's not a simple answer to that. Um, and as our work progressed, um, this simple question and that experience I had, which I'm sure many of you have had similar experiences. I mean, have you been to a hospital? Right? Did you enjoy it? Um, is, is actually a fundamental crisis and it speaks to the heart of the problem and the opportunity of design. And I think it tells it more than any other built space that we might be in. So I'd like to pose that there's a couple of challenges with hospitals and I'm, I'm gonna walk through both our work as well as the, what, what I might call a brief history of the hospital in order to get us there. Um, this comes from research we'll be doing at the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation that supported this and there'll be ongoing research we propose over the course of the year in a series of conversations. Um, but I'd like to say that three conclusions we've come to to date have been these. Hospitals are out of context or uh, inappropriate in their context. Hospitals we might call labyrinths. And hospitals stick around. And that last one I think is particularly interesting when we think about the design of new buildings. Um, the, the way in which I got to this notion that hospitals are acontextual was in fact a work when I d had the opportunity to go work in uh, in Africa, I, I, my story is that I had this experience with my father and then I got the great opportunity to go work in Rwanda my first year of design school uh, with the organization Partners in Health and they were struggling with dealing with basic health infrastructure but in particular they had informed me about hospitals which weren't working very well, in particular this one which is in Tugela Ferry, South Africa. And in this hospital in 2006, uh, an outbreak of, uh, uh, of uh, a disease called extremely drug resistant tuberculosis happened um, which in this facility, all of the patients that contracted it died, and they all died within three months. And they died because they were sitting in spaces like this, hallways uh, which weren't, as the director said, designed to deal with infection control. Hallways that weren't designed to deal with the diseases that might emerge there. When we think about um, what's happening today around in Liberia, around Ebola, we have similar uh, revelations about the lack of design or planning of the built environment, its effect on health. In particular, we started working in Monrovia in 2010. I was brought to Redemption Hospital. It's the major hospital in downtown Monrovia, um, as well as JFK Hospital, which had similar hallways like I saw in South Africa and in Rwanda. Uh, and in these hospitals, this is JFK Hospital, also known as Just for Killing. Um, not, a, not, a, not a, I mean, it is, I guess, a joke, but not a joke in that uh, the life expectancy of using this facility is low and people don't trust it. They don't trust the healthcare system and they're afraid to go to the hospital. And in the outbreak of Ebola, even aid, um, the aid workers uh, from WHO said don't touch the walls, don't touch the building, you may actually die from it. But the building itself is causing us to get sicker. Uh, and this is a fundamental issue what's happening currently in our current recovery or trying to cope with the lack of healthcare systems in, in Liberia. Uh, in Sierra Leone and in Guinea. Um, but it's also a kind of fundamental question of what and why were these buildings put there. And this plan, this kind of double loaded corridor, one that was familiar when my father was walking down and I've seen replicated throughout the subcontinent of Africa. Uh, it lacks airflow, it lacks ventilation, it lacks light, it lacks thinking about context. Um, and in particular, uh, it's making people sicker. And, and yet it seems like a relatively let's say, neutral plan, something we learn is not enough actually to start to address the major health crises we're dealing with. So these kinds of uh, extreme examples op like crack open some insight into what's wrong not only with the health system that we're exporting, 
the help building, the help design, but also what may be wrong with the way we're thinking about it here at home. So um, just to give you some kind of insight into that, this is JFK Hospital and this is John Kane Memorial Hospital in Pennsylvania. The two share a typological and formal relationship that they're built around the same time um, and the paradigm of health which may be brought us John Kane Hospital was exported to Monrovia in this first phase of aid and development uh, that we saw in the early 70s. And so I think the big question both in, in working in Rwanda and in working in Liberia over the last, you know, I've been doing it for eight years, um, is where do these hospitals come from? And why did we export this paradigm of healthcare design? And why is it making us sicker? And how can we change it to potentially address the ongoing health crises as well as social problems we're gonna be seeing around the healthcare space in the future? So the second point is a particularly, in, let's say, uh, trying to get at an answer to that, a conclusion that starts to look at diving back into history and understanding how the hospital got to where it is. So this is a brief uh, paraphrased kind of history of the hospital, so bear with me. Um, I'm beginning not with, let's say, uh, hospitals in the 15th century or even 14th century, but really in the 19th century around the biggest paradigm shift of hospital design and construction, what we might call the pavilion hospital, which emerged um, in the 1850s, in particular around the Crimean War, uh, where um, the uh, emergence of, let's say, tent, tents were clearly not good enough, and they're making patients sicker. So um, Florence Nightingale, as the story goes, you may know her, incredible designer, incredible thinker, um, real hero of anyone who knows anything about hospital design. Um, started to think about the hospital itself as performing better to improve health. And she came up with the Nightingale Ward, a ward which was designed in particular and very astutely and carefully measured in order to increase airflow, uh, increase light, uh, reduce infections in particular. That this was in some sense what some would call a sanitary, co a sanitary code embodied in a building itself, the code itself as a building. And the Nightingale Ward becomes the paradigm shift and really changes the way we think about design um, not just in cities, but also for a certain class, you know, the, the poor who are coming to these, uh, to these new built infrastructures in London, elsewhere throughout the world, and of course here in the US as well. Um, this pavilion hospital is pervasive for 60, 60 plus years, and we see it even in, uh, in the kind of early modern period uh, emerging in Boston here is the Peter Brent, Peter Brent Brigham Hospital, which the pavilion wards you can see uh, over here, kind of radiating out from the central and kind of heroic stately new building. Uh, and in 1913, this was the, this was the design of the day. Uh, these independent isolated wards, as you can see here, uh, were designed for specific airflow, were designed to clean air, were designed to eliminate smells and then introduce light. And the kind of performance of the building itself was designed specifically, we might say, for its context. It starts to shift a little bit uh, in what we would call the early modern hospital. Soon, soon after that period of time, what we start to see is, of course, the increase in technology and, and new typologies of space inside of hospitals. The introduction of the x-ray, uh, increase in, in quality and overall use of surgery. Um, and then, of course, with that comes the demand on medical spaces for them to be overly, uh, let's say, more, more available to higher classes and thus the demand of more private spaces and hospitals themselves. Uh, the almshouses or the hospitals of the 19th century were largely serving the poor classes um, and uh, patients who had more wealth were getting care in their homes. Um, this starts to change with the introduction of new technology and new surgeries where the hospital becomes the place of care itself uh, and the demand on the space becomes one of a bifurcation of class. Uh, certainly around the private and the public. And you see that here in the Brigham as well, the introduction of a new wing, which is all private rooms. Um, funny enough, that kind of also sort of aligns with the increasing sort of era of construction around um, even Fordism. And uh, Albert Kahn, the architect of Ford Motor Company, starts designing hospitals himself. Kind of this notion of the factory line of health care also starts to emerge inside the building. And you start to see that kind of privatization of space and the public space um, aligned with kind of current paradigms of construction and design around healthcare as, um, let's say, getting healthcare as a, as a factor in a factory line or 
um, you know, coming into a hospital, getting care, and leaving. This kind of notion uh, that you're on a conveyor belt and that healthcare is a sort of insertion and healing and leaving instead of a kind of notion of wellness is well articulated in the building itself. And we start to see that in Ann Arbor and elsewhere throughout the country. The next big paradigm shift in healthcare architecture happens, I would say, around the mid-century um, when hospitals are having to address this other issue, which is the increase in private space versus the medical space to have to control more and more patients with less and less staff. Um, and so the proliferation of new typologies of buildings and design spaces starts to emerge around uh, the construction and, and having to cope with, uh, having to cope with uh, more and more private spaces, what we might call the hospital as a machine. Um, and you start to see this new emergence of formal strategies to deal with control, the nursing station in the center and the ability to oversee in a panoptic way as many patients as, as, as possible in isolated rooms. That s then causes this kind of formal play which starts to emerge throughout the country in many different typologies from the circle to the rectangle to the triangle. Um, as you can see here, uh, the patient care units of the 60s and 70s are an attempt to control with less and less people. Um, emerges here at the Brigham as well and Bertrand Goldberg is really kind of one of the advocates of this design not only in hospitals but in housing around the Marina Towers in Chicago, you may know a River City in Chicago. He designs a number of different medical towers, bed towers, in order to address this challenge of control. Um, the, this is the Brigham again, so Brigham is dealing with this as well. Um, but you can also see that the nursing station starts to, let's say, balloon or grow. Uh, and that is the phase of the, let's say, the next phase of hospital construction, which is really the, what we might call the block hospital, which is coping with this increasing amount of uh, technology, uh, equipment space, and circulatory space in order to cope with the changes in care paradigms. Um, you might look at the advance of medical innovations and the kind of spike which is happening um, around, this is 1900 and this is 2000, so increase in, rapid increase of new and more innovations in medicine also align with the changes and pushing back against the medical space itself. Um, and sometimes challenging the Nightingale Ward um, and it, the performance of the Nightingale Ward uh, to be able to cope with this increase of technology, machines, new equipment, uh, and the stacked environment of the healthcare space. This expanded core becomes itself the hospital. You can see here technology in blue and circulation and HVAC systems in red. Uh, the kind of profusion of these systems uh, starts to take over the medical space itself and, and, and in a sense destroy any kind of performative ability of it to, to align in its context. Um, the most perverse examples of that being, of course, this turn of the century effort to seal or hermetically seal the building. And this is another Goldberg property in Stony Brook, which has virtually no windows, um, as an effort to, let's say, in, in some not only control the patients, but control the building itself, control the indoor air environment, and control it as a machine. This creates a very, very different medical facility, one which I think is best articulated by Alvar Alto's sanatorium in Finland, which was designed with open air uh, porches to deal with tuberculosis, which was then uh, glassed in in the mid-century so they could control the indoor air environment. Um, so a very smart building, and then one that's coping with changes that we're dealing with in our own buildings themselves, and control of the indoor air environment. The other thing that happens is the su substantial lack of, let's say, uh, the surrender to technology. Um, the Salk Institute by Lee Kahn is famous for its commitment to or its design of service and serve space or the interstitial space between floors to cope with the increase of medical equipment or technology um, that can't be placed or would rather not be placed to clutter up the kind of pristine um, monastic cells of study and research that he designed here. But that design idea emerges again in more typical hospitals throughout the country, notably here in Tufts New England Medical Center, where the interstitial space is the space not just of equipment, but the kind of surrender to the overwhelming and unexpected and uncontrollable emergence of increasing monitor equipment and technology that no one will be able to deal with and no one will be able to project or predict how it would clutter or consume the healthcare spaces that we might have to cope with in the future. The idea that the building is evolving faster than um, is the equipment is evolving faster than the building, that the two are not at pace with each other. 
is very much the challenge of this era and the kind of awareness that architects are coping with. And the SOC and the medical center in, in New England Medical Center show that paradigm of care is very much a, a kind of surrender by the architect to acknowledge that we can't actually control or cope with this constantly evolving system. So I'd say finally, in this kind of short history of the hospital, what we recognize is not just these specific building typologies that emerge. It's really uh, kind of the, the notion that the hospital is always evolving, that it is always constantly under construction, that the medical space is a microcosm of our healthcare system itself. It's the built interface of that healthcare system. Um, and that uh, in the Brigham, for example, you had the pavilion, the patient rooms privately, the modernist bed tower to uh, demolishing half of those and introducing uh, kind of ambulatory care centers and then weaving them all together because now they're this sort of disparate Frankenstein of medical spaces into uh, weaving them together with uh, atria spaces uh, that can be the only way to kind of seal or let's say bind together these very disparate paradigms of care built in buildings themselves um, to allow for this to be a cohesive whole. Finally, the atrium hospital emerges as our kind of primary design intervention of the last 15 years in medical design. And you can see that, the kind of aha moment, the kind of McMansion big atrium is sort of similar. Where are we going to get care and how do we s weave together these very disparate and confusing buildings that were designed for different paradigms of care? Um, in many ways, this is the sort of end of the Nightingale Ward. And Stephen Bedever, a great historian of hospitals, who says this, that the result in is a kind of disfigurement of the body, a kind of hodgepodge of appendages poking out from an original main, a building or a main idea. Uh, and, and the original may have dated from the, mid, from the early part of the century, but the result in is really this kind of Frankenstein, a kind of labyrinth, uh, a failed and confusing system with no end and one which is very difficult to traverse in some sense represents our very healthcare system itself, something which is confusing, binding, uh, dated, uh, and combined together in many different and awkward ways. The hospital is itself that system, and one design uh, no longer carries forward its primary motive or its primary agenda. And the notion that hospitals stick around is actually kind of, actually very much what we, you might say the inherited infrastructure that we cope with today. That it's not a design solution of one architectural strategy, but instead it's the culmination of many different architectural and design strategies accumulated together into a very messy whole that we're, we're left to deal with in an unideal way. Um, and there's some reasons for this. There were significant policy components that led to this. Um, there were a number of hospitals constructed from the mid-century, notably around the post-war era and the Hill-Burton Act, um, which committed to funding community hospitals. So the substantial amount of hospitals were built uh, between 1940 and 1960 with federal dollars, um, increasing the amount of beds to serve many more communities in those communities themselves. But that radically decreases up to today, and so much so that we're kind of overbedded, and the construction of new medical facilities radically decreases um, up into current times where we're simply dealing with new renovations and restorations of former healthcare spaces. So very little new construction uh, is happening today. Uh, and most construction is largely renovation. And this is in many ways uh, mandated by the Affordable Care Act, which also suggests that renovations and uh, restorations are largely what will be funded. Um, these are low budgets as well, under $3 million, and uh, in, in some sense, less heroic. They're not big infrastructure projects. And there's a sort of sense of that kind of caution throughout our nation of infrastructure projects, projects that are there to serve the community. Um, and also this kind of notion that we have to deal with what's inherited, that we can't, we're, starting, we're not starting from scratch, we have to deal with what's left over. And hospitals, again, I think are a very good, if not the best example of us suffering through old infrastructure and making it new again. Um, in some sense, where it keeps us from advancing is the question we must ask, and not so much can we destroy it and rebuild, but where is it keeping us from advancing care, advancing a healthcare program, advancing performance of the medical professionals as well as medicine itself? Um, and this simple question, where is the infrastructure keeping us from advancing, dot, 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 could be applied to schools, to housing, to 
and of course to medicine um, and to our cities themselves. So I would like to suggest at least from our experience that um, when we think about this, we think about it, um, well, we have some unique perspective from being able to work in, uh, in the Global South in Africa and in Haiti. Uh, and there's some lessons that we've learned that I think could potentially be applied back to the way we think about U.S. hospitals in a post-Affordable Care Act scenario. It also kind of allows us to imagine what is the medical space of the future, or the medical spaces of the future, uh, and to be, let's say, not reactive, but aspirational. And these are, I think, questions for us in design in general, which is to say, um, you know, if it's a question of sustainability or it's a question of resiliency, how do we as architects and designers advance a proactive agenda of architecture to perform in such a way to improve overall behavior and not to be reactive to uh, the shifts that we're seeing happen beneath our feet concurrently with uh, our buildings and then resisting that kind of change, but instead be part of that shifts, those evolutions that we're seeing. The hospitals, again, as an evolving organism, uh, offer us a great case study to imagine uh, a different way to understand buildings themselves. So I'd like to propose kind of four futures, just from our lessons here. And um, in those four, you know, we have some examples that we've tried to test this idea. But I think it opened it up to conversation around what other futures there may be. Uh, and, and how they start to affect the broader discussion around healthcare space. So the first is that hospitals could look, let's say could or should, um, more like the healthcare system itself. And I kind of mentioned this, but I, I think the hospital, uh, we learned this, the hospital is a reflection or the interface of the healthcare system itself. And we learned this, I would say, most notably recently in Port-au-Prince, where we're working on um, a cholera treatment center. So, uh, and this is, in, this is in Haiti. So, just a quick history of cholera. I mean, the last big surges, I mean, cholera has been endemic in places for the last century, but this is the, the largest and worst outbreak of cholera of the last century that hit Haiti. About 8,000 people have been killed by this outbreak. Um, cholera is a disease we largely figured out how to solve in the 19th century, and the last big, big outbreaks, the pandemics that were emerging of cholera um, were happening in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, increasingly, uh, in a kind of globalized way, we started to see the disease um, inc increase in, in virulency and hit Southeast Asia to, uh, to Europe, to London, to New York. And the epidemics of cholera, the pa global pandemics of cholera were uh, incredibly uh, debilitating to the city and to the increasing urban environment. That is until John's the story goes, John Snow discovers no one knew what cholera was or why it was affecting mostly poor people. Um, people thought it was bad behavior, bad morals, bad smells. There was just a confusion around health, why this disease would increasingly affect the destitute and the poor, uh, until John Snow dismisses all of those and discovers uh, a waste pipe uh, connecting with a water pipe uh, in, in London and sh sees that it's actually, there's a waterborne component to contaminated waste affecting the water source. Takes the pump um, handle famously off the pump uh, and largely ends that epidemic, localized epidemic outbreak. Uh, this begins the kind of era of sanitation design, affects our city here in New York, affects cities throughout the world. And really I think, in some sense cholera, I would suggest or go as far to say in doing and understanding this project, is the best example of the clear intersection between public health and design that really happened in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s. And there, there was a direct relationship between public health being designed, that design was, inter, um, uh, was being a, a component of, or like a fundamental piece of how we rethought our cities, and it was around the public's health, right? Um, Frederick Law Olmsted, Nightingale, uh, John Snow, these figures were designers, they were urban planners, they were architects, and they were public health advocates all at the same time. And uh, it was largely around cholera. So that happens, we change our cities, we uh, understand sanitation and water, we solve cholera to a large degree, and then suddenly a century and a half later, cholera starts to emerge again in its most virulent form in our most vulnerable communities, largely Port-au-Prince, Haiti. And so in digging into this problem, we realized that, okay, Port-au-Prince Haiti had some of the same problems as 1840s New York. No, uh, about 25% of the population had access to water and sanitation. Um, 
contaminated waste was collected uh, but, uh, but not decontaminated, so it was sometimes illegally dumped, uh, so affecting the groundwater itself. Uh, in some sense, um, the system itself, the system of water and sanitation had failed and was not allowing for uh, the population to get access to clean water or clean or decontaminated waste. And so when cholera hits Haiti, it hits and it becomes incredibly virulent. It is a very, very vulnerable condition post-earthquake. So for us to design a strategy to how to address this, we said, well, if, uh, if the building can help heal, what, what, what must the building do in order to address the failure of the system itself, a failure of the water and sanitation system itself? Uh, in some sense, the solution would be, well, why rely on a failed water and sanitation system that isn't working or a subterranean piped system that isn't working and let's decontaminate the stuff here on site itself. So this is just a diagram of um, a, a pavilion hospital, very much in the Nightingale a kind of canon, sitting on top of waste decontamination facility. So a five bay um, anaerobic biodigester, which con collects all of the contaminated waste uh, and decontaminates it on site, making it clean of waste so it can be reintroduced into the water stream and the, in the groundwater. Uh, this simple idea that uh, the building could be off-grid, both in terms of electri electricity but also in terms of waste decontamination, uh, for us is a kind of response, a proactive response to the failure of the system itself and an effort to address this through a multi-pronged approach, both off-grid solutions as well as a commitment at the policy level to invest in large-scale infrastructure. But knowing that large-scale piped infrastructure would take 20 years and 20 or 80 billion dollars, we can start now with some off-grid strategies that would be low cost. This building is, uh, I was just in Haiti last week, it's very close to being finished, uh, it'll be done by the first of the year. And the idea here is that uh, the building itself the inter is the interface. It recognizes and um, makes transparent the system beneath it, right? The system that isn't working beneath it by bringing visibility to the, uh, to the opportunity to solve this crisis at, the, at its crisis point, at the hospital itself, where all these patients are coming and collecting that contaminated waste and decontaminating it while it's there. I think uh, the other really huge lesson that we learned in this work abroad is that um, hospitals, and this is particularly important when we think about um, the Affordable Care Act and a sig the significant policy shift that we've seen in our country, um, is that this is actually a new civic r identity. Right? Healthcare and hospitals become a new civic um, uh, of identity for us as citizens. It becomes part of our citizenship to be able to get health care. And thus the hospital also could or should um, retain and project the kind of images of the infrastructure of citizenship. Right? This, of course, is the Supreme Court. But what are, what are the kind of heroic as well as uh, identifiable uh, architectural uh, nods, architectural and design components which suggest that you are now participating in your own identity as a citizen of this country. Uh, this is something that I think is a fundamental identity shift that the ACA may in fact impart upon us as citizens of the country. To think about hospitals not as the place where you go to get on an assembly line to get poked and prodded and then hopefully come out healthier or at least uh, disease free but actually a, a part of participating in your identity as a citizen of the country. We learned about this, I think, notably when I was working on a redesign of a hospital in upstate New York, Northern Westchester Hospital, which in many ways uh, mirrors uh, the challenges that the Brigham has encountered in Boston. Uh, this is a community hospital that was built during the Hill-Burton Act. Uh, it has way less funding um, and way less uh, civic identity than the Brigham does, but Nonetheless, it serves a crucial function to this dis constituency, um, and it saw the writing on the wall that in the post-ACA that this would be a subs this could be substantially defunded, uh, would only get renovation appropriation, uh, and could possibly uh, completely be abandoned itself. So, what would they do to start to address its both immediate and long-term challenges? Our lessons about let's say Nightingale Roads or buildings that would be designed to reduce infections, uh, reintroducing natural ventilation into medical facilities, uh, 
came uh, particularly potent here, and we recognized that this old um, concrete shell, a kind of curtain wall, uh, a very heavy skin could be removed um, and upgraded. And by removing that heavy uh, curtain wall, we actually could introduce a lighter one and add floors to the building. Four floors could be added to the original columns, uh, introducing kind of different programmatic opportunities like we may call a wellness floor, um, uh, and making this an amenity that the community would use beyond just for acute care, but actually for other services. We saw this happening in Africa, and so we're pretty convinced it can happen here. But I think increasingly, uh, architects and, and theorists of the hospital are, are suggesting as much. There's examples, um, the Henry Ford Hospital in Dearborn, Michigan is often quoted, or, or, or kind of uh, shown as an example of this where weddings are happening in the main atrium space, and there's so many weddings happening that it's booked out more uh, than for uh, uh, the local conference uh, center, that, that people want to come for other reasons than just uh, medical care if it's a nicely designed space and has amenities that can be offered for the community itself. So I don't know about you, but you might think about getting engaged or married in a hospital. Um, but I think the idea that the hospital becomes something else uh, is, is something to chew on and something to think about because the, the programmatic comp element of the facility itself will change and will evolve based on the kind of different, um, let's say, uh, regulatory as well as design uh, like layers that we can impart on it. The design of the facility then becomes something else. It becomes a kind of heroic symbol, civic symbol, something that can be used differently, something that we can uh, sort of showcase as um, uh, a way forward for medical design. Um, I think another future of medical spaces, uh, and this in particular I think relates to the interior design community um, and to the way in which health is trending is this notion of personalization or customization of healthcare spaces. Um, just, you know, it, before the mid-century, to a large degree, especially, well, let's say the beginning of the century, to a large degree, healthcare was happening in acute care facilities and in doctor's offices, if not the home. Um, but as we know, that's now radically changed in terms of the different kinds of spatial, uh, sp spatial programs where healthcare is happening. Everything from dialysis centers to diabetes centers to, you know, the libraries to the school. Um, and this is a cacophony of different spaces and different regulatory hiccups to get through. But the, the reality is, is that healthcare is happening all around us. And in order to capture it, we have to think about these spaces differently. Uh, retail clinics are popping up now, especially in the kind of first post affordable care uh, era. And then, of course, funding for home care, elder care, uh, end of life care uh, is happening increasingly for the home, uh, which offers all sorts of, I think, interesting and uh, exciting opportunities to think about the kind of safety and care uh, that is afforded in the home. My grandmother is 94, and, and she has the great fortune to be able to be cared for in her home. I, I think putting her in a nursing home would be, at this point, you know, <coughs> horrific and probably accelerate her, her, her last years. Um, so I think there's great dignity in this opportunity, and yet there's great challenges. You know, of course, there's um, uh, falls, the space, you know, f falls are one of the biggest issues uh, around uh, medical care now. Um, the infection control issues, I think, are relevant here when we think about these micro spaces. Uh, other issues that we haven't even begun to think about around that have been o over regulating hospital and acute care facilities uh, have not yet been deployed on the customized uh, spaces of homes and, and CVSs and Walmarts and other places where more and more of your primary care is going to be occurring. And so there is a design challenge here, right? There's an interior design, there's a, an architectural design, there is a, a design problem in, embedded in inheriting different types of buildings in order to provide high quality care, which again suggests either a breakdown or an acceleration of the system itself, which we could then start to replicate. Um, of course, the kind of future of healthcare, I think, gets, gets viewed this way from the patient room itself, what I might call the iPadification of healthcare. There's this sort of um, notion that the interface gets consumed into the wall. Um, I think this is probably a viable and realistic option for certain places and certain classes. Um, technology, of course, is being uh, uh, is being foreshadowed here as the kind of primary mover of this healthcare space. Uh, 
Um, and of course, as quickly as it gets projected forward, will likely become obsolete. Uh, but needless to say, what it does suggest is that there is an, in, an inherent tension with what I suggested before, the over-monitorization of healthcare. Uh, no longer uh, might we walk into a medical, you know, a medical room or a, a, a patient room and see so many different monitors telling the doctor and the nurses exactly what's happening inside the patient that's sleeping there under bright lights with lots of noises around them. Um, we may be able to have a much more dignified experience where you can see on the dashboard uh, and make more transparent exactly what's happening within you. Uh, and making that kind of visible connection uh, is a really exciting potential of healthcare. We might call that, you know, we're seeing that, of course, with um, the proliferation of new kind of healthcare uh, amenities or accoutrement, kind of appendages of our own body which suggests uh, to make visible what's happening within us uh, so that we can make better decisions about our own care program instead of relying on those who can translate the monitored uh, environment all around us to, to make those decisions for us. That's an exciting potential future. What I might suggest is one of architecture itself, one that's much more customized, much more personalized, uh, much more identified with those who occupy that space itself. Again, back to context as one key um, one key element towards the future against where we've fallen before in the past. Um, we saw this in particular when we thought about uh, around a hospital we built in Rwanda. Doctors needed to live there uh, in order to attract high quality medical professionals. And so, you know, our question was do you build like a basic dormitory for people to live or do you actually design places where they would want to live and move and move their families and make and customize for their own selves? And the sort of notion that uh, the housing infrastructure actually could be customized, um, highly customized to the, both the climate, uh, to the people that would use it, um, and um, uh, to the space itself, uh, made us realize that this could actually add to a healthcare program. It could actually add to uh, doctor retention, which is a key metric of healthcare spaces in general. Um, most hospitals will track uh, doctor retention. And retaining the best doctors is also a sign of a great hospital. So building great housing, um, which we designed and customized the furniture to and customized the lighting and customized this uh, entire environment. Um, we recognize that customizability is something that's a really unique feature and I think relates back to the patient room itself and its uh, inability to accommodate uh, many different users. Right, and finally, I would suggest that hospitals could become more contextual and thus, back to my original point, more humane. Um, so this notion of context is, uh, again, I th is one of these tensions of architecture and tensions of design that we grapple with. Should there be a prototype that you replicate 10,000 times throughout the country because it's a good enough prototype? Or should you customize and calibrate every single example in each place for its specific contextual needs? That tension is evident in Ebola, it's evident um, in healthcare spaces more generally around this country, and it cuts at the kind of ambiguity of our role as architects and designers to both customize for certain use and yet prototype general and generalize um, for s systemic um, accommodation, right? So uh, generalize, so it, it meets all of your regulatory code uh, needs, but it yet deals with the very humane and contextual needs of that specific patient. It thinks about my father, it thinks about um, his needs. It doesn't just think about him as one number, one cell, and many other cells in the building. Uh, we had the opportunity to really think about this in our kind of first project, which was a, a hospital in northern Rwanda, which the housing was part of, uh, which we finished in 2011. In, in, this, in this hospital um, uh, began as a kind of ground groundswell of many different uh, incredible partners, the Ministry of Health, uh, Partners in Health, a great NGO, um, a great donor came in and said we want to build something unique. But it was, what was so fascinating about it was how evident it was that we could not rely on the paradigms that were being projected from like the U.S. and current medical care. Um, mainly because we couldn't rely on electricity. We couldn't, we didn't have a reliable electricity, electrical grid. We couldn't rely on uh, waste decontamination. We had to do it ourselves. Um, and we knew from our, from our research that there were significant and dangerous diseases, what we might call 19th century diseases like TB, uh, emerging in this area and we had to deal with them. So 
uh, going back to, let's say, paradigms of care before that were dealing with similar constraints around the system itself, i.e. we couldn't rely on electricity, but we could build a building that could reduce infections, um, we return to the Nightingale Ward, or maybe even more to the Alto Sanatorium, to understand where natural ventilation could emerge as a unique feature, where those hallways that I mentioned could be removed. Um, this is the only hallway in the building, uh, and it has, there's no glazing, it's this giant open air, um, uh, open air space. Um, and how we could leverage this specific site that we had, this sort of saddle of this mountain, uh, in order to accommodate and amplify the potential use of the site to reduce infection rates. So that's very simple, right? That's get people outside, that's make them walk outside, that's um, make people use the landscape itself. So in that simple design strategy, uh, we had to actually rethink the standard hospital plans that the ministry had, that double loaded corridor, that, cor that hospital that was sent to uh, Liberia, uh, that kind of standard prototyped USAID uh, intervention, which was basically drawn by somebody in Washington with a very simple, um, kind of good enough idea of what could be basic and work. That does not work. When deployed uh, in places that have limited constraints, uh, or many constraints and limited resources, um, things, unintended consequences could happen, like the emergence of new strands of, of diseases and uh, the kind of unintended consequences of overuse. So in here, we realized one of the things back to the kind of, we started to look at the history of hospitals. So the Nightingale Road became very useful. Updating that to our current needs and this current site became the goal. Um, secondly, the notion of control. We learned from a mid-century hospital also became really relevant here. Uh, instead of thinking about the Nightingale Road where patient beds were lined around the perimeter, we wanted to increase light and air. Uh, as well as control from the nursing station. So we inverted that and we created the central conduit so uh, every patient could get a view of a window. And recent research from Robert Ulrich, not that recent, let's say 20 years ago, um, was suggesting that patients who had a view of a window uh, would take less pain medication, would get out of the hospital quicker, would have a direct, or have the view of nature through a window, not view of like a brick wall, which is a case study had uh, two, um, two different sets. Would reduce, infect, or would reduce infections, potentially reduce time, reduce pain medication, that there were substantial health benefits to views. Uh, those are interior design strategies. Those are thinking about the space of the interior itself. That's the building operating and functioning with the use of it. And um, those simple, let's say, iteration on the Nightingale Ward with some new research, um, coupled with notions of control, not only having the nurse being able to control the ward, but also the patients control the nurse, so she, she or he could not hide uh, as, as they were doing, were efforts to address uh, the kind of specific care potential and healthcare system that was happening in Rwanda and to build a facility around that. Here's just an example of that in diagram. Um, and we're seeing that it's working uh, in that we're getting the kind of airflow that we need. It turns out it's not five air changes per hour as Nightingale and the Brigham suggested it's 12 air changes per hour that now the WHO uh, suggests is what's needed to reduce infection, but we can get that through just stack and uh, mixed mode system. Uh, and we can also think about the building itself as, as I mentioned, kind of a civic amenity. And the healthcare outcomes of this facility in the four years that it's been, you know, three years that it's been uh, alive have been substantial. We've seen um, the largest drop in infant mortality ever recorded over the last century or since it has been recorded. I mean the largest drop ever recorded in Rwanda is happening around this hospital. Which is to say that, you know, it's not to say that the design of the building alone or even is a fundamental component of this healthcare outcome, but it is to say that it's part of that system and that it's attracting more patients, that there's more people delivering here, that more people are coming early and getting educated to deliver here so that mortality rates are dropping substantially has the appropriate amenities of like, let's say the early modern hospital of a new and in intensive care unit, uh, proper operating rooms and theaters. And uh, the healthcare outcomes are substantial. And so this kind of notion that we can, um, if we work collectively, both on a system upgrade, a training upgrade, a facilities upgrade, affect major healthcare outcomes as possible, uh, it suggests that architects and designers have a role in that to play. And so when we think again or back to why it was that, let's say, JFK Hospital was built with this care paradigm. And so 
to date has largely not worked or not evolved or not, uh, let's say, coped with the changes in both care as well as the system of health care in Liberia, which, you know, just to repeat what's happening in the country, it's, it's suggested a failure of the health care system. Uh, a, a poor healthcare, a weak healthcare system is the reason for this outbreak. It's made it more vulnerable. And that system is related or is made up of failing or non existent medical facilities that people are afraid to go to. Our role as designers and architects is to design a better system or help design a better system, to uh, think about the buildings themselves, that interface of that system, and make sure that they're working for that specific context and that specific environment. And then is to load it with the kind of designs of the environment so that they produce dignity and hope to those people who are suffering in an enormous way in these environments. And that kind of racetrack that uh, I first learned mostly about the failure of our own healthcare space is brought back to me when I think about Ebola today or I think about the Ebola treatment <laughs> unit, which is not about dignity, it's about the efficient mechanization of care uh, and the quick and sort of urgent solutions to uh, epidemic disease, definitely needed, uh, but not the long-term implications of the care program on the country for years to come. And the lack of thinking about that, I think um, that long-term implications, that long-termism versus short-termism, is exactly where we must reflect in uh, the current state of our own healthcare infrastructure and how we seek to address it as both designers and architects. Um, and how, let's say in particular, we think about the direct relationship between our intended health outcomes and the designs of the buildings that we hope to make. Um, because the two are related. We can go back to Nightingale, we can go back to Olmsted, we can go back to cholera or tuberculosis and remember that there's a direct relationship between our buildings and our ability to live a healthy life. Uh, and if we remember that fundamental lesson, I think that I've learned mostly from working abroad and thinking about it here, uh, we have an opportunity to really rethink and re-question uh, what we expect from our healthcare spaces, what we expect from architects and design, um, and, and if we can get there, we can start to track how that's greatly improved our lives individually as well as collectively as, as, a, as a people. Um, I just think about this last quote to, to end, which is to suggest that if we can do such a thing as that, both be individual and collective, we start to imagine not just the cost of what the building might be, that kind of under $3 million intervention that the ACA suggests, but actually something greater, right? We start to cost out the externalities of not investing in our infrastructure itself. Uh, and this kind of question of not the cost of architecture, the question is what's the cost of not having architecture, reminds me of the kind of current debates we're having around, you know, the failure of our infrastructure, the failure of our bridges, the failure of our roads, the failure of our healthcare, the failure of our educational systems, like the big, massive, huge, uh, and overwhelming role we as architects and designers have to play in addressing um, not just the renovation or restoration of our country, but the rebuilding of it from a kind of ashes of failed investment over the last 50 years. So back to these lessons, I think we can start to imagine or still quantify what is possible. And if we can do that, we might have a brighter future, a brighter citizenry, uh, and architecture and design play a big role in that. So I'd like to thank you for having me talk to you tonight. <laughs> No, no, that was my, for, I give a little bit of my background, I mean, that was my first experience to, to work on this fortuitous, I guess, opportunity, and in pr putting together this lecture, I was reminded of this experience up here on the Upper East Side with my father, um, uh, and, and, and being reminded of, uh, it wasn't as linear as I may have made it seem, you know, the, the Batara Hospital didn't emerge because I was reading Nightingale's book, right? It emerged because we were thinking about context. And it was only later when I saw Nightingale's work that we were kind of pushing and pulling with the design uh, to understand, oh, wow, that makes a lot of sense. And this part could also be updated. But it wasn't, you know, we weren't kind of, nor had any of the doctors been um, educated by the history of healthcare architecture. They were just 
using plans that had been borrowed and deployed into ministries many years ago and thinking that they were good enough. Um, and I think Dr. Farmer and others knew that that wasn't good enough, that the space itself had to have dignity. And so they were curious about the role of architects and designers to do more. That, I don't think they expected this, and I don't think they anticipated what that might mean or how far we could go, but I do think they recognized a deficiency of design thinking in medical space, and in particular, uh, in medical space abroad. But keep in mind, these doctors are all, you know, some of the best, if not the best, some of the best doctors trained in the U.S., and they're working in the best hospitals in the U.S., right? So they're very familiar with the way they imagine uh, this is the way a surgical suite has to be. This is the way the, you know, the isolated rooms have to be in relationship to the, to the, uh, to the nursing station. This is how hallways should be. This is what works. And there's a kind of understanding of that ecosystem. And some of it works, and some, a lot of it's workarounds, and some of it doesn't work, but I wouldn't say that it's very evident of why those designs uh, were the, the way that they were and what era they came from. So part of this work is to kind of reveal at least that there was reasoning behind some of it, and maybe that reasoning no longer is valid, but at least we understand why that emerged the way it did. And so we can make better decisions in the future. Uh, that's a long way to answer that. Yeah. Bill. So Oh, tell me, because this is good to be back. Was uh, uh, the concept that people are afraid to go to the hospital, mm. that you articulate that, and especially, I, I've read a few books about this, but especially when you think about our country and about how many people stay away from the hospital because they're afraid to do that. So how do you translate that, I'm going to call it a discovery that you made, into something that can be uh, uh, imparted That's a great question. I, in fact, in, in some testing of this, this is all new content, so it was clumsy, I apologize. The, um, one of the things that I, I was going to talk about but didn't put in here is, uh, another conclusion I would say is perception matters. And I, we learned that from that quote when I read in the New York Times about Ebola, like don't touch the walls. The perception that the medical system isn't gonna work actually has a fundamental effect on the medical system not working itself. Like those patients did not go to the medical spaces because they were more afraid of the hospitals than they were of their homes, which was part of why um, the outbreak became so, spiked so much in the summer um, because the doctors that were going there to address it were not able to penetrate the deep and rural and hard to traverse areas of the inner country around where the outbreak had originally emerged. And so care in the home, uh, the, the reason that Ebola curve has started to drop in Liberia is because there has been an aggressive, locally-based, home-based strategy with community leaders to start to, uh, you know, rapid diagnostics and actively test temperatures so that they're starting to get it before it comes to the problem where they're already going to the hospital and they've touched, you know, 20 people on the way. Um, and that's done by some really, like, Lema Gaboe and other amazing activists who have been able to sort of push the needle and address this uh, in great horror, of course. But I think the answer to your question is that it's so evident that the perception of the medical facility being a terrifying place actually led to a larger failure of this medical system than may have ex existed if these buildings were thought to be as places of healing and care and you know, citizenship and um, dignity. And that's an important lesson for designers because it means that the work that we're doing actually has a significant effect on perception. So that's kind of our realm. Of course, you have to have good service, good doctors, you have to have good results, but the perception that the building is gonna work, which, you know, I don't know if, I don't perceive this facility working. But go back to your picture of Ebola and think about, I mean, to me, when you showed that one shot of the people in the, in the masks and whatever, it's been permeating the media. I mean, you can't go whether it's Fox News or Al Jazeera or whatever it is, they have, I mean, this is your talk, but how do you change that? How do you get those people to, to see that showing all this depressing stuff is not destructive? Yeah, well, I'm not a media analyst, but I, 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 I think, <laughs> 
I mean, I think, I don't know. I mean, but I, I do think there is, I mean, obviously, th this deeper question is about um, the, the immediate and urgent response to crisis, which a lot of is largely around health crises, the funding that goes in early on, and the lack of investment in long term infrastructure. So as we saw, well, we saw it in I think we <laughs> I think we saw it in cholera, right? There's a huge funding for cholera. Emergency tents went up that looked just like this. Um, now there's none of those tents are there anymore. There's one center that treats it, and that's our center, which isn't yet finished. So three years later, you have finally a piece of permanent infrastructure that's going to address this if this spikes again in the future. But the funding is all dried up for cholera treatment, right? And so the the same problems that we have in our country about addressing long-term infrastructure, we have in aid as well. Um, and so the question for us is how do we leverage this investment early on in, in short-term needs and carve out a, a portion of it, 5%, for example, that could go to long-term investments over time to address the systemic problem that would address perception, right? Not address just the urgent, the urgent uh, care of like large, vast numbers of an epidemic. And so there's where I think in that space between long term and short term, which by the way can be 20 years in a you know, refugee housing settlement, um, is, is the role of architects and designers to come up with some systems change that also deals with these bigger, stronger issues around uh, dignity, uh, around uh, perception, around uh, like we care about you, we care about your life as a, as a country. You know, I mean, I won't even get into all the other things around Ebola, it was at the UN on Friday with this Ebola Action Network, but it's, you know, no kids have gone back to school yet. The food agrarian crisis is about to spike. You have a major, so this has just rippled into a systemic failure throughout the country in general. And so, uh, you know, we're only dealing with the tip of the iceberg of a large scale uh, multi-year disaster, which we, if we don't address that now, we will probably see other problems in the future. Not to be so down and, down and dirty, but yeah, please. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I, I, I'll go back to answer your very specific question, which is how do you deal with this very specific and tight regulatory environment, which is very hard to innovate in? Um, you know, I think one way to do it would be to work within the system. Another way to do it would be to circumvent the system and to ask those harder, bigger questions, which would then affect the system itself. We see that here in New York. I just had a meeting with Jeanette Sadi Khan who said, if I had gone through all of the meetings that I had to go through to change the code for transportation infrastructure in New York and gone through all of those sessions in Congress, I would have gotten nowhere. So I just wrote it myself, got the people to support it, and did it in New York, right? And then changed the code, and now all these cities are adopting her code. So that is system change because she's redesigning the problem. You know, she's asking it from a different perspective. It's not how do we work within this already ballooned and terribly regulated infrastructure to solve this issue. It's how do we circumvent it in the most creative way with vision and with a, like, a diehard commitment to changing this and, and getting it done and implementing it. That's really the challenge. So I think here we have a unique, inf a unique opportunity in the US to address what you are talking about, which is a space of no wiggle room. And I know it's a space of no wiggle room in US healthcare because healthcare spaces are largely terrible and great architects are working on them and they're not creating great works of healthcare space. And I will say this to any healthcare architect and we've had that conversation themselves. It's so constraining, it's so difficult. So, now of course there's good examples that are emerging, but I think um, for us to address that bigger systemic structural problem, we have to come at it, I think, as Jeanette did from 
uh, from another perspective, another side, and start to affect that regulatory infrastructure itself with visionary projects. So introducing natural ventilation is a very good example. So the Euro in Europe, in Japan, in Finland, in many other countries, natural ventilation is being reintroduced into medical spaces. But for some reason, we can't do it in the US. So that doesn't tell me that it's for any good reason that code is there. And it tells me that if we start to talk to ASHRAE, which we have, or we talk to other regulatory bodies and introduce strategies that will address the code, we could start to chip away at that, that one problem, which could have great effect on kind of carving out space within the healthcare environment. Did that answer your question? It's a multi-pronged approach. And I think architects have to do it through let's say visionary projects, we have to do it through clever regulatory wonky work, and we have to do it through actually participating as civic members of society, and, you know, be on boards and be on regulatory bodies to make those changes. Dead in the water. Oh. <laughs> but it's not because they weren't interested. It was, um, I, it's because of, uh, uh, because as the funding went, they, uh, they lost a significant amount of funding in this kind of post-ACA environment, and the community hospitals are getting chipped away at by local dialysis centers, local healthcare providers, and these hospitals in, in New York um, are starting to increase their market share up more north than New York State. So I think what one, one conclusion of this is that we see uh, in the healthcare system, no one knows exactly what will happen, but I, I think there's a trend to suggest that he healthcare becomes more disaggregated. That's probably true. Um, but also, that means that the increasingly acute spaces become more behemoth. And so we're seeing the Brigham become larger and larger. We're seeing Sloan become larger and larger. We're seeing, uh, we're seeing you know, uh, Cleveland Clinic replicate uh, Cleveland Clinic in Abu Dhabi and, and throughout the country, or the Mayo Clinic. And so there's a, a sense of, uh, let's say, polarization, I think, with our, with our strong systems and our, the ones in between are those community clinics, which I think are going to suffer. But I don't know, you know, we still, there still could be potential in the future, it's sort of up in the air, but it was a fun project to help us think about a little bit. Any other questions? Yes. I know what you're saying, yeah, and I, I think I, uh, you know, that, that last point about <laughs> where should we go, should we adjust more community-based care and, and, and increasing acuity in the, in the main center is, hap is happening, right? Uh, we also uh, have to keep in mind that there is this huge amount of more people that are getting health care, right, that aren't coming to the emergency room, right? We're unloading the emergency room. So that allows for, as you say, not only chronic conditions, but compounded chronic conditions. You know, people who have never had significant care are coming in 
um, with you know both diabetes and obesity and you know um, you know HIV or I mean many different components to who knows a, a compound diagnosis and so those are holistic uh, uh, care programs that need to happen outside of the building itself um, in, in the community in their home with caretakers and I think we're going to see a, we will see a lot of that you know moving and um, that's going to change the way we think about the healthcare space um, and so I was hoping to talk about it. hopefully that came out in some some level to in this presentation but I would s the reason I call it the, hist the future of the hospital is because I think we still need to think really creatively about that space of acute care itself because that space, um, that architecture, is the kind of symbol of that whole disaggregated system, um, and itself is not coping well with the evolution of this this rapid evolution that's happening in front of us. Todd, yes. yes uh, thank you. Last question. Thanks for that impossible question. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know it's a. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right, yeah. It's I hope it's a giant. Sorry. No, I, that's actually no. It's a very interesting question. Where would we where would we apply resources immediately? And I, I think um, I was having this conversation with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and and um, and getting them interested as a foundation in investing in healthcare research. And they said, you know, what's missing is that when the emergency breaks. Um, everybody's looking for shovel-ready projects, but there's no shovel-ready projects ever, you know, because they haven't been designed for the specific emergency that you're dealing with, right? So how do we start to um, invest early on in the research required to accommodate and, and be available when the emergency breaks uh, is a problem of design research. And the current paradigm of the architectural business model is such that you require a commission in order to do the research and you are barely chipping away real research from the commission itself. You're just trying to make ends meet. Um, and so how do we expand the design research um, work that needs to be done, needs to be multi-year, multi-pronged, multidisciplinary, and deeply engaged in order to come up with solutions that we can then hand to USAID and say, hey, when you can hand to the Department of Defense and so when you're dealing with Ebola, we have a couple of strategies that you should think about in your uh, treatment of this. As opposed to what we read in the New York Times, which is some military guy sketching out an Ebola treatment unit in a van on the way from the Monrovia airport to the healthcare space, you know, which is like, completely ridiculous, right? Um, so I think we as a design community have to advocate for, one, foundations to invest in design research. So I would, I would probably put it in design research. Um, to allow for more organizations to do significant research that is not that is objective, that is actually based on real results and not completely about us getting market share over a certain typology, um, and then and then three, I think it's important for the philanthropic the state and the funding community to to build uh, primary examples, show ex showcase examples of uh, of those, let's say. You know, sort of, uh, let's say the results of some of those things. Um, and the reason for that is because you need to show implementation in order to affect, I think, to prove that it's possible to change the system. And so this goes back to the problem of, let's say, competitions or design competitions, which are only about kind of coming up with ideas that for free, at no money and no funding, which, you know, by definition suggest a lack of investment uh, in real research. Um, it, and then coming up with really haphazard solutions or, or, you know, let's say secondary solutions to primary problems that we have, real structural problems that we have. So that goes, I think, I think that's, a, that's a, a real cancer in the design community that we rely on free work, unfunded research, uh, and real limited research in, de in design companies themselves to, to solve really 
I mean, what we're talking about is deep systemic problems, like deep structural problems. This is not a nice, you know, facade problem. This isn't really a, you know, this isn't about how you get the CAT scan in this building, and this isn't about where you put the sink, although that's a, that is one issue of it. It's really about how do we s redesign healthcare, um, and how do we redesign our educational system. Those are systemic issues. So, I don't know, I got on that tirade, but, um, so I think we need to invest in design research, and I think we need to build key catalytic projects that can showcase it working. Any other questions, David? We we done here? Okay. Well, we can continue the conversation. Five minutes. Space the Have a drink. Thank you very much.